times have we heard that old cliché describing something that is stranger than fiction? This is often said about stories from the past, and with good reason. The past is a strange place to those of us who live in the present. But the story I am about to tell you really is one of those stranger than fiction stories. The wonderfully shocking tale of a woman who defied the rigid gender norms of her time. A girl named Catalina de Arazo was born in San Sebastian, Spain in 1585 to a prominent Basque family. When she was four, her parents placed her in a convent where she lived until she ran away at the age of 15. It was at this point that she discovered she could move more freely in the world if she looked like a man. She cut her hair and from then on wore only male clothing. She eventually made her way to Seville and boarded a ship for the New World, where she ended up in the southern frontier lands of the Viceroyalty of Peru, fighting the Mapuche Indians in Chile. After years on the battlefront, she continued to live a somewhat vagabond life in the highlands of the Andes, gambling, drinking, and getting into sword fights with other vagabonds. She killed and maimed was chased by the law, and occasionally spent time in jail. After 20 years of passing as male, she at last confessed to the Bishop of Guamanga in Peru that not only was she a woman, but an intact virgin as well. Word of her unique and curious story spread quickly, bringing her fame as La Monja Feres, the lieutenant nun. In 1624, she returned to Europe where she petitioned the Spanish king for a military pension and the Pope for permission to continue dressing as a man. She was granted both. It is at this point, allegedly, that Catalina writes her story in an autobiography titled Historia de la Monja Alferes, Escrita por ella misma. In 1630, she returned to the New World, this time to Mexico, where she worked as a muleteer under the name of Alonso de Arazo until her death 20 years later. We tend to think of the 17th century as a time of rigid gender roles, much more restrictive for women than men. The life pathway society set forth for little girls, at least from elite families, was one of two choices, marriage or the convent, both of which secluded women behind walls, away from the wider world. In such a setting, Catalina's story seems incredible, raising questions not only about the details of her life, but also larger questions regarding the interaction of sex, gender, and identity in this strange world. Her story can function on two levels for us. On one level, it functions simply as a window through which we can glimpse daily life in the Hispanic world of the early 17th century. For example, why was such a young girl placed in a convent by her parents? What role did gender play in their decision? And why would Catalina, as a young man, travel halfway around the world to Peru? And what was it like there? The other level on which her story operates is buried in the deeper, more hidden layers of gender identity and its boundaries. Boundaries which Catalina clearly breached by passing as a man. What was Catalina's sexual orientation? How serious was her transgression? And if it was, why did the political authorities and the public at large react so positively to Arasso's story when she had been found out? In other words, why was the outcome celebrity and not punishment, given the rigid gender norms of that era? Catalina begins her autobiography by telling us, in a matter-of-fact and unsentimental way, that her parents raised her at home, then sent her to live in a convent when she was four. Why, we may ask, 
Would parents choose to send a child away from the family home at the tender age of four? We know that Catalina's family was large. She had four brothers and four sisters, nine children for whom the Arasso parents needed to arrange secure futures. All of Catalina's brothers made their way to the New World, serving in the Spanish crown's expansion of the conquest in South America. But the Urasso daughters, like all women of their class, were limited to just two acceptable paths in life, conventional marriage or life in a convent. Both institutions protected women, especially from situations where her honor might be questioned or compromised. Only one of Catalina's sisters married. The other three lived out their lives in the same convent Catalina had been placed in. Honor was a central part of Iberian culture. A family's honor was determined by their status in society and their lineage or family background. The concept of limpieza de sangre or blood purity was an essential part of an honorable lineage, meaning that the family had no Jewish ancestors in their past. Another vital part of the family's honor was the sexual purity of its female members. Daughters were to be virgins until marriage, wives faithful to their husbands, and widows chaste. Any real or imagined violation of these sexual norms not only dishonored the woman herself, but her entire family as well. Because of this, girls from high status families were always brought up out of the public sight in highly protected environments. The concept of honor was also central to Catalina's life as a man. Like other young Spanish men, she traveled to the New World for the promise of wealth and adventure, but also for the prestige and honor that could come from a courageous performance on the battlefield. When Catalina arrived in South America, the Spaniards were well into expanding their rule southward from their capital in Lima, Peru. By the end of the 16th century, they had conquered most of the former Incan Empire, which stretched from Quito down to roughly central Chile. Catalina took part in the Araucanian Wars, a protracted series of conflicts between the Spaniards and the fiercely independent nomadic Indians that lived in the southern half of Chile. It is here that, after several daring acts of bravery, she was promoted to the rank of second lieutenant. Catalina's stories about her travels through the Andean region show a clear lack of interest in the world outside the Spanish realm through which she wandered. Within its pages, the curious reader finds very little about the life ways of native Peruvians or the landscape in which they lived. Instead, Catalina's adventures, as she roams from town to town, reveal a motley bunch of Spanish characters, mercenary soldiers, gamblers, criminals, and assorted ruffians that one would expect to find at the fringes of an expanding empire. Her interaction with these sorts is one of skirmishes and sword fights, usually over a perceived insult or another. It becomes clear early on in her memoir that she has a prickly personality, is hot-tempered, and easily prone to violence. So what are we to make of Catalina de Arraso's story at the distance of some 400 plus years? It's tempting to view her tale solely through the modern lens of feminism as an example of one woman's struggle to live fully in a world where patriarchy kept women shut out of the full experience of life. Moreover, as a tale of gender disguise, it might seem to us that it's really about sexuality. But Catalina is fairly silent about her sexual preferences, merely hinting every now and then at an erotic attraction to other women. Only once in her memoir does she state explicitly that she has a taste for pretty faces. But there is so much more to Catalina's story than this. 
Historians of early modern Spain tell us that passing as the opposite sex was a serious transgression. Those who disguised themselves as the opposite sex, whether male or female, undermined the clear boundaries of gender identity that brought an essential order to society. If Catalina's transgression was so grave, why then did she emerge from it, not only without punishment, but as a celebrated figure as well? Several scholars have suggested that part of the answer might lie in the Hispanic Baroque culture of the period. A taste for things that were shocking, bizarre, and exotic held a special fascination for the public imagination. The hybridity of Catalina's condition, her lack of fit into the binary categories of male and female, the mixture of nun with lieutenant, certainly fed popular curiosity about her and her wondrous life story. But other things worked in Catalina's favor as well. Her distinguished military service for the crown and her highly prestigious family background, both of which she played up in her petition to Philip IV, no doubt were important factors in a favorable outcome. But none of these would have been enough to excuse her from her transgressions if one more key condition had not been in place when her biological sex was finally revealed. And that is the fact that Catalina, after a physical examination ordered by the church, was found to be a virgin, or as she states it in her autobiography, an intact virgin, as on the day I came into the world. For the early modern church, of course, virginity was an essential attribute of female virtue. Had Catalina's transgressions included evidence of sexual activity, severe condemnation by the Spanish Inquisition surely would have been the outcome. Lastly, we shouldn't underestimate the role geography played in Erasso's success. The New World, so distant both geographically and metaphorically from an old and inflexible Europe, certainly was a space that provided more opportunities for someone like Catalina to refashion a new self, breaching even the immutable boundaries of gender identity and its norms. Mm -hmm.